Hayes, and this video is about how YouTube is creatively and artistically dying. As a content maker, I've already broken some of the vital rules of YouTube. I've made this video over 10 minutes long, so most people won't watch it. I haven't used a reactionary thumbnail of me clutching my face in horror. I haven't used jump cuts, and I've not asked you to like or subscribe. I'm fully aware I've made all of these mistakes, because they are actually part of the problem. In this video, I'm going to explain 1. Where YouTube came from and its original purpose. 2. The golden years of YouTube and what it was like during the early age of the internet. And 3. How we've devolved into the advertising-ruled corporate sludge of content we are now in. As with all my videos, I'll be analysing the facts and figures available, as well as adding my own personal experiences in as examples. So grab a drink and settle in, as we explore the reasons why YouTube is dying. And then I will tell you, in my opinion, the exact day it died. Let me be clear, YouTube is not dying financially. YouTube is owned by Google, whom in turn is owned by Alphabet, one of the largest, most powerful companies on Earth. They're simply too big to fail, and will continue to run YouTube for many years yet. The death of YouTube is not monetary. It's an artistic death. A creative death. It is my belief, as a YouTube content creator and avid user, that YouTube itself is now a breeding ground and home for vapid, meaningless content, such as effortless fake prank videos, over-sexualized, creepy videos insidiously aimed at children, and multinational companies using it as a hosting site to re-upload reality TV shows, talent shows, or adverts, and double their viewership. What YouTube has become is so far from what it was, a hosting site for fun videos, creative people, allowing anyone with a camera and a good idea to achieve recognition. YouTube provided a free platform for anyone with a creative message or passionate idea to broadcast it to the world. And because of this, the site was full of unique, interesting individuals sharing their passion and creating content that truly mattered to them. While many content creators do continue to do this, these golden days of personal passion superseding business decisions are far behind us. So the question is, why? And when did this happen? The largest issue we'll face in this analysis is YouTube itself is similar to a living organism, with small evolutions and mutations happening slowly as time moves on. One video may do something that achieves fame or viral status, and so another will follow it and copy it and do it better. Which video do we then say started it? The first attempt to create a concept, or the first to perfect it? A visual example is on the screen now. These brilliant pictures are illusions of one thing morphing into another. We can all agree it starts as a bridge and ends as a ship. We can agree the swap happened somewhere around here, but the exact moment is impossible to mark. Much like this picture, we can all agree the early years of YouTube contain videos such as Me at the Zoo, Star Wars Kid, and Leroy Jenkins. These are all videos uploaded out of passion and belief that what they were doing was either personally significant or entertaining to other people within their same subculture. These videos were uploaded because the creators valued them as pieces of art. They were significant moments in the life of those who made them, and that moment was worthy of being shared. Contrast that with some of the latest offerings on the YouTube corporate machine. I browsed the YouTube trending page on a fresh install of Chrome on a cookie-free computer, and was recommended the review for a new phone, a re-upload of the NFL halftime show, and a video about giving $10,000 shoes to an already rich person. These videos aren't made out of passion or personal connection to the content. They're either a direct advert, a re-upload of a corporate staged event, or a shameless display of wealth through consumerism. If you're sitting there thinking I pick and choose these examples specifically, then go to the trending tab and let me know when you find anything more artistically valid. To truly pinpoint the exact day YouTube died, this video will include all the major turning points and time periods when changes happened, and the few important videos that were major milestones in YouTube's history, and thus shaped its future. 
With the intro out of the way and the goals set, let's examine the history of YouTube and see where it all started. The birth of YouTube. The early internet, for those who remember, was a Wild West-style wasteland. Everyone had a homepage with garish spinning GIFs and tiled repeating backgrounds. The few games sites we discovered hosted rudimentary Flash games, and Bebo reigned supreme as the social media of choice. Before graphic designers, talent scouts, and advertisers had discovered the awesome power of the internet, it was inhabited by those lucky few who had an internet connection, a computer, and the knowledge to make it actually work. With such a limited pool of people able to use it, the environment was much more specialised. Message boards and forums about specialised specific hobbies, text-based adventure games, and classic RuneScape were the go-to sites. Social media, as we know it today, didn't yet exist. Then, on February the 14th, 2005, YouTube.com was activated. The first video uploaded was titled Me at the Zoo, an 18-second long review of the elephants at San Diego Zoo, by YouTube's co-founder, Jawed Karim. The early site design was typical for all sites of the time. Straight lines, a block colour background, and a simple search bar. Nothing too flashy. In May of 2005, the public was allowed access to a beta test version of YouTube, and the very first video to hit 1 million views was a Nike advert featuring the football star Ronaldinho. Looking back on it now, this should have been a grim example of where the site would go to. By December 2005, the site was receiving over 8 million views a day. In 2006, YouTube was bought by Google for $1.65 billion worth of Google stock. By 2007, YouTube was consuming the same amount of bandwidth as the entire internet did in 2000. I believe it's fair to say in only two short years, YouTube had established itself as the number one video sharing site. And then, on August 2007, YouTube aired the very first advert from a major company. These adverts included TV spots for Fox, a trailer for The Simpsons movie, and an advert for BMW. These adverts were the beginning, I believe, of the golden age of YouTube. The golden age. The golden age of YouTube started in June 2007 with the launch of YouTube Mobile. Smartphones didn't take off globally until the early 2010s, but YouTube could see the direction society was heading, and YouTube Mobile ensured every person with a phone would also be a person watching YouTube. From June 2007, YouTube would enjoy a golden age that would last 12 years. During this time, its power and influence grew beyond all expectations. It would go on to attain more than 15 billion views per month. By February of 2017, over 400 hours of content were being uploaded every minute, creating a backlog of content physically impossible to watch all of. It was during these 12 years that, just like our morphing picture from earlier, changes would slowly creep in. The popular videos would morph, the viewer base and online landscape would shift and change, and ultimately, YouTube would have mutated so far past its original purpose, it's now a shallow husk of what it was. As I mentioned earlier, it's difficult to point to a single exact moment when a change or switch happens, so let's examine the major moments in the history of YouTube during this golden age, and discuss how they're all stacked together, to guide us to where we are now. All these changes happened simultaneously, they affect and interact with each other. So this isn't a direct timeline of events, it's more a compilation of causes. In 2007, YouTube began paying its content creators. This was a major move forward for those that uploaded popular or regular videos, and made the possibility of being a professional YouTuber into a reality. Payment was based on views and adverts, so content creators now had a vested interest in beginning to make videos that would be popular, shareable, and engaging. At this time, content creators could simply keep focusing on what they were already well known for, as the audience was already watching them. Knowing views now meant income, the race for hundreds, thousands, and then tens of thousands of views now had a point beyond bragging rights. It meant 
money. The first video to hit 1 million views was an advert for Nike. Advertisers have often been notoriously slow to keep up with changing technology, but once they do, they'll drown it in paid promotion and endless marketing. YouTube's success placed it firmly in the crosshairs of every advertising company on Earth. If this website was boasting millions of views a month, then getting your adverts there was essential. Print media and billboards are ancient relics by now, and being where your audience is can make or break a product. So YouTube started to expand their advertising. The unfortunate reality is that an advertising company, unlike a single YouTuber or even small group of YouTubers, has enough capital behind it to hire famous actors or sports stars and then promote the video. It is far easier to make money when you already have money, so those smaller content creators had to sit back and watch as the site they loved and lived for became swarmed by professional advertising agencies. Adverts were applied to many YouTube videos, from the pre-video ads to the banner ads at the bottom, or larger adverts to the right-hand side. Then, on November the 1st, 2018, YouTube released a blog stating they were considering placing two ads at the start of a video. And, dear viewer, we all know how well that decision went. YouTube was now closer to terrestrial TV than a video sharing platform, playing adverts before any video you wanted to watch. However, they were willing to open this benefit up to smaller creators too. YouTube determined the shortest a video can be to fit two adverts on it is 10 minutes. This meant all content creators could effectively double their advertising income by making videos that were several seconds over the 10 minute mark. Any less would be less income, and any more would be a waste. This is one of the major problems, the 10 minute mark. The optimal time for a video to receive maximum income for minimum effort. I'm going to leave this on the screen, as it's one of the important factors that has brought us to where we are today. So, YouTube content creators now needed to aim for slightly over 10 minute video if they wanted to keep the income stream at maximum. However, a study conducted by Microsoft in Canada has discovered the average human attention span is slowly going down. The main cause being various streams of media allowing a person to become more easily distracted. This information means, as a content creator, you have roughly 8 seconds to catch someone's attention and if you fail to do that, they'll click away. As a creator, you have two ways of doing this. The first is the video thumbnail, the small image of the video you see before you click on it. Early YouTube simply created the thumbnail from a frame within the video itself, meaning what you could see was guaranteed to be a part of the video at some point. Then the system allowed the content creator to choose from a selection of frames within the video to be the thumbnail. This led to a wave of videos starting or ending on a specific frame to guarantee that frame was a thumbnail choice. And now, every video may have a custom thumbnail uploaded for it. This custom thumbnail is a small but major change, as it allows the content creator to effectively create a mini advert for this video, and condense the content down into a small picture. Unfortunately, this often isn't the case, and instead, the thumbnail is used for shock value, reactionary anger, or straight-up dishonesty. With views and clicks now ruling the income and videos only needing to be 10 minutes long, the thumbnail is your chance to entice the viewer in, and this has resulted in the thumbnail becoming the single biggest lie in advertising. Red circles or arrows around meaningless parts of a picture, a shocked face edge highlighted in a block primary colour, logos and company names, the thumbnail has gone from a real screenshot of actual content to a manufactured overlay designed to grab your attention and pull you in. It's important to note I'm not saying this is specifically a bad thing, it's simply another layer of advertising. But when combined with all the other changes, it does help explain how YouTube 
has slowly died. The second is the title. Related to the thumbnail, the video title has also morphed over the years. A title must be short enough to fit on screen, especially the important mobile market, but long enough to explain the video. If it fails to explain the video, it could instead shock, intrigue, or offend, as long as the result is the video being watched. And unfortunately, this tactic is much, much more effective. Humans are naturally emotional creatures, so a video titled Me and my friends act out a pre-planned situation, we have fun, wouldn't create an emotional response. But the video title Pranks in the hood, gone wrong, gone sexual, almost died, do. You have the random capitalization to attract the viewer's eye, the good, playful nature of the word prank, juxtaposed with the danger and socio-economic problems of the hood, and then the natural human responses to pain, sex, and death, creating an emotionally charged title that all but demands the curious or offended give it a click. The thumbnail and title changes are reflective of a larger change within the internet. The demographic shift away from older academia and towards preteen and teenage market. The majority of YouTube views are now from mobile devices and are from majority teenagers to early 20-somethings. The home computer and skill needed to access the internet in the early days meant it was an exclusive club. Only those with the patience to make it work had any access. It wasn't simply a case of clicking the app on your phone. It was sometimes a case of port forwarding so your firewall stopped blocking Command & Conquer. The PC, laptop, Mac and smartphone situation has changed all of this. Suddenly, access to unlimited entertainment and media was widespread, and the viewing demographic of YouTube changed. It was no longer heavily focused on 20 to 40-something men, and was now mainly children to older teens, a mix of all genders, cultures and backgrounds. This demographic shift and ease of access meant the content creators and advertisers could have an absolute field day with the content they created and the way they marketed it. The younger a person, the fewer experiences they have had, and because they haven't had time to filter out the trash media, the more susceptible to both advertising and emotional manipulation they are. This meant content creators had to change what they were making to appeal to this new market, and could market it in a much more direct, emotional way. The famous phrase, the customer is always right, doesn't mean you can make unfair demands of a business. It means if there is a demand, the business should create a supply. And the demand for preteen, teenage, and young adult content and entertainment had exploded along with the smartphone. A one hour lecture on the history of something may indeed be a fascinating video, but it's no longer what is demanded. The new audience want entertainment, and they want it now. Reactionary, celebrity, immediate. You may, as a functional adult, laugh at the video Do Not Call Enderman from Minecraft at 3 am three exclamation marks. You may laugh because the title is in all caps. It references the popular game Minecraft. It tells you to not do something which we all know children react badly to, and it uses the supposed demonic time of 3 a.m. All things a young viewer would emotionally react to, paired with a thumbnail of a shocked YouTuber holding a photoshopped phone with a big red arrow pointing at it, for a video of slightly over 10 minutes. You can laugh all you want, because this specific video has 4.7 million views. That is a lot of advertising revenue. Now you may be shouting, it's parody, it's satire, it's done to tear down the thing it's supposedly being. To which the response is, one, it still got clicked on 4.7 million times, and two, for a parody to exist, then the original thing must also exist, and the original must be popular enough that the parody has also become popular. This video is, so far, the amalgamation of all the decisions we've looked at, but it doesn't end there. TV companies and film executives now saw the awesome viewer power of YouTube, and began uploading clips from shows and movies extensively.
Highlights from last night's reality singing show, or whatever season of Survivor, Big Brother, Love Island, Dancing with the Stars, Kitchen Nightmares, we're on now. TV shows realised that no one was watching their own catch-up services, and even if they were, it wasn't the demographic they were after. So, 10-minute clips of the best TV flooded YouTube, because the video hosting platform was, to them, nothing more than a second free advertising arena. Moving away from the larger companies and onto the content of the video itself, if you've watched any YouTube recently, you may have been asked to like and subscribe. And if you're a long-time YouTuber, you might be feeling the practice of being told to like and subscribe is becoming much more prevalent recently. And that's because you're right. The act of asking a viewer to like, subscribe, or ring the bell icon to receive notifications is done because of one simple truth. It works. Videos that remind people to do that receive more of it. They get more clicks, more likes, and build the channel up faster. It's simple maths. Some of you may be saying when a video does this, it makes you less likely to do it. I'm afraid you are the exception and not the rule. Remember how the younger a viewer is, the less armoured they are against the manipulation of the media? That is the viewer this tactic is aiming at. Liking and subscribing to a channel all feeds into the channel's analytics. Creators can see what does and does not work, and where their views are coming from. I am no exception. I'm able to see and access all the data I want regarding my videos, and that data tells me making this video is a bad idea as most of my audience are MMORPG fans, not YouTube history fans. I'm going to add that as another major milestone, the asking for likes and subscriptions as another moment we went from being early YouTube to now. This action of asking for likes and subscribes all comes from content creators having access to their channel analytics. Complex data and spreadsheets, charts and graphs that tell us exactly what, where and who is viewing our content. We can see the average age, gender, geographical location, watch duration, how those videos were discovered and when people clicked away, which videos led to which other. And knowing all of this is a double-edged sword. As a content creator, I now know exactly what I need to do to increase views and revenue. But on the other side, I now know exactly what I need to avoid. Videos which are not popular or do not interest my audience. It is this information that guides me to make both correct business decisions, even if they're not personally artistic or fulfilling. Knowing a video will make me happy, but receive no views, or knowing a video will bore me to make, but be popular, places me, as a creator, in an odd position. Do I follow my own passions and projects, or do I make what the people want? This access to analytics is another major YouTube change, because knowledge of what does and does not work fundamentally changes what a creator chooses to do. I am a big fan of game theory, but the sheer amount of Five Nights at Freddy's content they put out is staggering. Why do they put out so much Five Nights at Freddy's content? Well, because it gets views, and I'm willing to bet their analytics tell them to. Once a hobby becomes a job, it fundamentally changes. It is no longer about the maximum enjoyment for the participant. It's about financial compensation. In other words, it doesn't matter if you're happy, you need to get paid. This is a far shot from the YouTube of old, where videos were uploaded to entertain, intrigue, and educate. They're now uploaded simply to be watched. And it's often the young, immature, and unsuspecting who are tricked or manipulated into watching. With all the information available to us, any business-minded individual can see exactly what to do to make the most money. Create content aimed at younger children, preteen to teenage. Make the videos just over 10 minutes long. Include reactionary and attention grabbing thumbnails and inflammatory titles. And then make the content itself move at a breakneck pace. Lots of jump cuts to keep the short attention span. 
Lots of over-sexualized, gorgeous people. Danger, mock violence, scary situations, references to popular things. A smart individual would realize the audience demands to be entertained, and it is not that discerning when it comes to content. And so they'd make videos featuring bad acting, fake situations, displays of imaginary wealth or impossible stunts. And this is absolutely what YouTube has become. The rise of the prank channel in the late 2010s, the reality vlogger, the rich playboy or party girl sharing their life, the over-the-top angry reviewer. These are people entertaining an audience. It may not be clever or different or artistically deep, but it doesn't need to because the audience that's there doesn't demand that. They simply demand content. With the audience watching these channels and these people constantly, we then inadvertently created a new breed of celebrity. One that has direct access to their fans and which fans can communicate directly with. The Hollywood heroes of years past were always impossibly out of the reach and lived off in fenced housing. But YouTube stars were different. They were real people you could leave a comment to, watch daily, see at conventions. YouTube became a platform for these content creators to not only entertain, but to enrapture the audience themselves. Certain people, just like actors or singers, became more important than the content they created. This is another major changing point in the lifespan of YouTube, the relatable celebrity. Anyone with access to YouTube could now dream of becoming a famous YouTuber. The 80s had children dream of being rock and roll stars. The 90s were full of aspiring actors and astronauts. And now, studies have shown us the most aspired job in primary and secondary schools is YouTuber or Twitch streamer. As with the creation of any celebrity, the advertising companies took immediate interest. Sponsorship deals have existed since celebrities have, with Roman gladiators being used to sell weapons or food, but the new normal was now the YouTube star, a popular personality you could trust, selling a product you needed. In the early days of YouTube, no one would have imagined a single person sitting in their bedroom full of artistic passions and the will to entertain could achieve this a life as a superstar, company deals, and legions of adoring fans, yet here we are. This leads me on to the two final points before we take a look at the specific day YouTube died. On screen now is a picture showing the top 100 YouTube channels in 2010 and then again in 2019. The channels highlighted in red are ones started by a person or group of people we could refer to as YouTubers, passionate entertainers with a flair for showmanship and the drive to make videos. Channels not highlighted are owned by companies or corporations, groups who would simply see YouTube as a means to an advertising end. This picture tells us a sad story that before the world's advertising executives decided to get their claws into YouTube, the top 100 channels are 80% YouTubers, people passionate about what they do, and 20% companies, people passionate about profits. Compare that with 2019, and we effectively see the opposite. Companies and corporations now make up around 72% of the largest YouTube channels. A platform designed to host videos is now mainly used for selling products, pushing consumerism. And maybe that's the way any platform within a free market goes. It's inevitable it will eventually end up being used by those already rich to make them richer. YouTube proved itself by capturing the world and providing the best possible video hosting service easy for anyone to access and anyone to join in with. And this, in turn, turned it into the world's largest supply of willing viewers for every advertising company ever. Smaller content creators who wanted to keep up now needed to adapt or die. Adapting meant copying the best practices of those who were already succeeding. In this case, that's the large companies. Perhaps the largest advantage these companies have 
is the ability to put out vast amount of content in a relatively stable time frame. YouTube's algorithm favors content creators that produce 10 minute videos or more often, daily if possible, as bringing viewers back day after day is habit forming, a noted advantage to advertisers. A company with paid staff is able to create content 24 seven and so take advantage of the algorithm promoting their videos. A single creator is not. This means any young creator needs to devote a huge amount of time to creating and constantly putting out content, even if that means the quality suffers. Daily YouTubers value quantity over quality. Channels such as Every Frame a Painting or Ross's Game Dungeon may be high quality, well written pieces, but because they're not daily, they won't be promoted. It's a content treadmill, and if you can't keep up, you'll be left behind. This is another important factor, important enough to list. Sticking to a schedule, easy for a company, hard for an individual. This corporate dominance happens slowly and insidiously, and has now left YouTube a garish, ego-filled cesspool of high-quality content trapped on tiny islands within a maelstrom of crap we're pelted with every day. A sea of sludge masquerading as entertainment. Re-uploaded low-value TV shows and fake reaction videos take human emotion to the extreme for views, because views and subscribers are all that matter now. The content itself is a distant second. And this situation, I believe, came to the boiling point on the 29th of May, 2019. The day YouTube artistically and creatively died. The creative death of YouTube. Much like the picture of the ship emerging from the bridge illusion earlier, there is no single moment when YouTube morphed from what it was to what it is. It's a combination of various changes over a long time. But it's always nice to choose a single defining moment, one important act that we can point to as the moment of change. And I believe I can name it. During all of 2019, a young man from Sweden named Felix, known by his stage name PewDiePie, was locked in a bitter race against the Indian multi-million record and film company T-Series, to become the first YouTube channel to reach 100 million subscribers. This was a phenomenal landmark for both YouTube and internet culture. In one corner, PewDiePie, a guy from Sweden who grew up playing video games, had worked hard and carved out his niche in gaming culture. He created videos of him playing games, reacting to popular videos and interacting with his fans. You do not need to like PewDiePie to like what he represents. The original idea of YouTube. The idea that anyone could, with hard work and passion, find a place, gain attention and entertain people. PewDiePie may not be your favourite YouTuber. You may dislike him or even hate him. But his place within internet and YouTube culture and history is that of the single passionate person, doing what he loved and entertaining those that also enjoyed it. On the other side of this battle is T-Series, an Indian multi-million company founded in 1983, which began uploading YouTube videos in 2010, mostly film trailers and music videos. This was a company simply designed to make money through music and film. That's not necessarily a bad thing. All companies attempt to make money. But for T-Series, YouTube was not a home or a culture. It was a means to an end, an advertising platform to further the reach of its manufactured products. I'm not saying you have to dislike T-Series or that companies are bad. I'm saying T-Series represents the use of YouTube by companies in a strictly profitable business decision and nothing more. During May 2019, both T-Series, the multi-million company, and PewDiePie, 
a guy with a camera, were locked in a neck and neck race to reach 100 million subscribers. Countdowns were set up, live trackers were added, and people watched in anticipation. PewDiePie was supported by some of YouTube's most well-known content creators. But, unfortunately, on the 29th of May 2019, T-Series reached 100 million subscribers first, beating PewDiePie by roughly 4 million people. It is this day, the day a multi-million pound company beat a guy in a room with a camera that I believe YouTube artistically died. Some people celebrated, some people cried, and some didn't care at all. But it was this day that represented something more than just a single channel reaching a certain milestone. It represented the fact that multi-million pound conglomerates were here to stay, and they were winning. YouTube is now the home of companies and corporations advertising campaigns. YouTube celebrities are paid to use certain makeup, play certain games, or wear certain clothes. TV shows are uploaded moments after they've aired. Film trailers, songs by famous artists are pushed and recommended. Rich people living rich people lives dominate and control the majority of the YouTube trending page because views matter more than content. YouTube will continue to push this because the audience YouTube now has demands more content just like this. And so now you can be a YouTuber and upload whatever you like, but if you want to treat it as a job and become successful, then you best get ready to make a video that's just over 10 minutes with an over-the-top reactionary thumbnail and emotionally charged title. Fast editing and quick cuts. Remember to ask for those likes and subscribes. Remind people to ring the bell. Maybe include a TV show or film or game because YouTube, as a job, is all about hitting your analytics. YouTube is a brilliant website and is home to some of my favourite content creators. Mauler, JXC, The Lockpicking Lawyer, Carl Jobs, The Spiffing Brit, Saberspark, Larry Bundy, Pro Jared, Miracle of Sound, all people who follow their passions and create content they value and care deeply for, and all have found success in their own specific way, both financially and artistically. But when Baby Shark can get more views than all of these channels combined, because that's what the audience want, then I have to admit that YouTube, at least artistically and creatively, is dead. Thank you very much for watching. If you have any feedback or questions, leave a comment below and I'll try my best to respond. If you want to chat to me live, then I'm usually on Twitch over at twitch.tv forward slash Josh Strife Hayes. Who are your favourite small YouTubers? Who produces content that you believe is artistically viable? Leave them in a comment below and I'll try my best to watch them. Thank you very much for your time and have a great day.